Hi, uh, good evening. So this this Saturday we'll be continuing our lecture series. This time on drugs in leprosy. We have already covered dapsone, rifampicin, clofazamine, and thalidomide last week. Uh, not regarding that brief interlude of two weeks we had. So this week we'll be continuing with alternative therapies in leprosy or second line drugs that we would use mostly in the cases of uh, proven drug resistance in leprosy or mostly if some of those first line drugs would not be uh, used in patients uh, for example if you have severe hemolytic anemia with dapsone or if, if you have severe hepatitis or dress with uh, rifampicin you might want to consider or know about what are the second line drugs and how you can treat uh, lep uh, Hansen's or leprosy when those drugs are not available or you are not able to use them freely in your patients. So this week we'll be discussing alternative therapies in leprosy in including the second line drugs. Now why do we need uh, this kind of second line drug management for leprosy? So as you can see if I just focus on our country in India more than 10,000 are still suffering from leprosy or developing leprosy every year. So we understand that as of now and this is I think 2019 yeah 2019 data it's WHO data and this is the URL which you can go and see I'll put that URL in the description so you can go and read the whole report of, the, of leprosy by the WHO and it says that nearly 80% of global leprosy burden is covered by our country India with Brazil and Indonesia okay let me just remove this yeah and indonesia and just about or just slightly more than global leprosy burden are roughly about 53.6 percent of global leprosy burden is by india alone clear so we need to focus on uh, leprosy management and that's why we need to know about second line drugs now uh, why do we need alternative regimen what's the need of having a alternative regimen for leprosy first of all your patient might develop resistance to the first line drugs the rifampicin dapsone and clofazamine uh, not particularly clofazamine but dapsone and rifampicin are fairly uh, drugs which uh, m lepre can get you know uh, res resistant to additionally the second important reason could be non availability which we mostly see in clofazamine so clofazamine uh, has brief spells of non availability in the market and sometimes you are in a fix how to treat your patient when clofazamine is not easily available so you might have to shift to second line anti leprosy drugs now side effects as we have mentioned in the introduction part yeah as we have mentioned in the introduction part the side effects for example hemolytic anemia with dapsone or uh, drug uh, dapsone hypersensitivity syndrome or dress caused by rifampicin or a severe hepatitis or uh, clofazamine causing uh, pigmentation clofazamine uh, a non-availability is always there so side effects and adverse effects are additionally points that we should know about second line management of leprosy and last and the most important point is that leprosy has to be treated we, you cannot just because a drug is not available you cannot just refer the patient to a higher center hoping that the government will supply now remember that as per the national leprosy eradication program everything for a leprosy patient everything for a Hansen patient is treated free of cost in a country the government gives everything the government gives the medications drugs anything uh, prosthesis or orthesis to take care of all the deformities and disabilities everything is supplied by the government okay so just because the drugs are not available in uh, around you there is no need to refer the patient to government center of course you should because the whole treatment then becomes free of cost decreasing the burden of management on the patient you should refer it to government center but it doesn't mean that you don't start treatment start the treatment and make sure the person starts mdt and then you can withdraw your treatment so leprosy has to be treated so for the resistance in leprosy remember that of the of the uh, first line drugs first line drugs in which which includes your rifampicin dapson and clofazamine resistance is a big issue for the first two the rifampicin and dapson so in the case of leprosy rifampicin resistance plus minus dapson resistance plus minus quinolone resistance can happen okay 
Clofazamine resistance is not that proven in the literature. So I will not be focusing more on clofazamine resistance rather than we'll focus more on dapsone, rifampicin and quinolone resistances. Now remember that there is no R plasmid mediation transduction of resistance. That means if a, a bacteria, if one single M. leprae bacteria is resistant to a single drug, let's say rifampicin, through the mechanism of plasmid transduction, it's not able to transfer that resistant knowledge, that resistant genetic knowledge to a, another bacteria which is not resistant. Okay, So plasmid mediated resistance is not transferred from one M. leprae to another M. leprae. Clear? Now uh, there is a concept called, called primary versus secondary resistance. Okay, so primary means, yeah, primary means that a person who has not been treated with any anti-leprosy drugs gets infected with the M. leprae, which is by itself resistant to first-line leprosy drugs. Okay, while secondary resistance is because when M. leprae who was initially sensitive to those drugs, initially sensitive to first line drugs through the course of treatment or through the course of inadequate treatment now has, has is now resistant to the, those first line drugs. Okay, so that is what we mean by secondary resistance. Now what are persisters? Persisters are those M. leprae bacilli who gradually develop tolerance to first line drugs. That means at the start of treatment, they were very much sensitive to first line drugs. But over the course of treatment, uh, the uh, tolerance has developed in those bacilli and that is why now they are resistant. They don't acquire resistance to genetic mutations. That means the mutations are not present before beforehand and they tend to remain dormant in a non-dividing state. That is why they are known as persisters. They persist. They remain in a non-dividing state and remain in a dormant state. They don't multiply and cause a relapse of disorder. And these bacilli can also become sensitive later on. That means when the treatment is continued, these persisters can become sensitive to first-line drugs. Okay. Another concept is drug resistance determining region. Drug resistance determining region which is known in short as DRDR. Okay. So what is drug resistance determining region? Now, if we look at the genome, the genetic material of M. leprae, certain segments of genetic of that genetic material will encode for gene. For example, the FOLP1 gene, uh, FOLP gene in uh, Dapson or RPOB gene in Rifampicin. Now, this segment of genetic material encodes for the uh, specific enzymes or specific ribosomes which are blocked by these antibiotics. Okay. And this coding region, this specific coding region of the genetic material is known as drug resistance determining region. That means any mutation in that region will lead to a drug resistance and that is why collectively it is known as DRDR. We are clear on that? So let's move forward. Now very shortly, uh, very in quite a short uh, explanation ex in an extremely brief manner will discuss methods to find resistance. Of course, there are multiple methods apart from these four. But since these four were mentioned in IAL second edition textbook, I'll be covering in very, very briefly on what these methods are. So these four methods include mouse foot pad, mutation detection by sequencing, sequencing, mutation detection by DNA microarray, okay, and Bedemeyer method. So mouse foot pad method, sequencing, mutation detection, DNA microarray, mutation detection and Bodimeyer method. So one by one we will be seeing this, these uh, all four methods. Now first is mouse foot pad method. It was uh, using this method, Dapson resistance was first reported in the year 1964. Before that there was, there was no good method or essentially there was no method to detect resistance in leprosy okay so this became the first very important method to find out whether your bacilli is resistant to any drug or not okay so that is why this is the gold standard to look at the resistance in leprosy now how do we do uh, uh, how do we go forward with the mouse foot pad method Around 5,000 to 10,000 bacilli are inoculated in the hind paw of the mice. For example, let's say, okay, let's take a scenario. Uh, your patient comes to you and you suspect that the patient is resistant and you want to use mouse foot pad method to find whether the patient is resistant or not. 
okay so what you take is you take a skin sample of the patient from the lesion you cut it into very small parts mix it up and around about 5000 to 10000 bacilli is there in the solution uh, i don't remember uh, how much uh, it's a good viva question that how much bacilli are present in gram of tissue and i and that is actually mentioned in in an uh, somewhat old book known as hastings i will try to find it out and put it in the comments that how much uh, bacilli are present per gram of uh, tissue okay so you take about 5000 to 10000 bacilli and in, inoculate the hind paw or the uh, the back paw of the mice with the tissue and slowly slowly over the course of 25 to 30 weeks the bacilli multiply and reach the final concentration Okay, reach the final concentration of 10 is to the 5 to 10 is to the 6 in 25 to 30 weeks. Okay, so what happens is that while the bacilli is growing, that means during the 25 to 30 weeks, while the bacilli is multiplying inside the hind paw, the mice are fed with a sequential diet of diluting dapson concentration. Okay, so you get the strongest concentration, then, then one tenth of that, then one tenth of that, then one tenth of that. And sequentially, you dilute the dapson concentration, and you have a control which is a mouse, uh, a mice which is sorry, a mouse which is not fed on a dapson diet. And then you compare the amount of bacilli growth or the development of lesion in in subsequent groups of mice. Okay, so depending on what the concentration of dapson allows the bacilli to grow, you say it as low, intermediate, or high. For example, if the concentration of 0.0001 of Dapson allows the growth and any higher concentration of Dapson does not allow the growth, it becomes a low resistance. Okay, it becomes a low resistance. If a concentration of 0.001 allows the growth and any higher concentration of Dapson does not allow growth, it becomes an in intermediate resistance. And if only 0 0.01 concentration of dapson stops the growth of bacilli and anything higher stops the bacilli but the bacilli is able to survive at dapson concentration of less than 0.01 it, it is termed as high resistance am i clear on that if you're not clear just rewind few seconds and listen to it again uh, the higher the concentration of dapson that inhibits the bacilli growth the higher is the chances of resistance or the higher is the severity of resistance because now you require a larger amount of dapson to stop bacilli growth okay now the disadvantages of mouse foot path method remember that mouse foot path method is a gold standard okay so the disadvantage is that it requires chilled samples because you need to transfer those bacilli to a lab and uh, for it to be inoculated into the mice you require viable bacilli that means if the bacilli is not able to reproduce or multiply that effectively or if the bacilli is not alive the mouse footpath method being an in in vivo method is not able to actually judge the bacilli, the uh, resistance in bacilli and you have to kill mice so poor mice have to be sacrificed for the greater good and uh, that is not a good preposition to have so methods were made to develop uh, to are uh, developed so that you don't have to resort to animal death okay and additionally there have been instances when when a, a certain strain of bacilli will not grow or, or uh, will not grow in mouse foot pad but it has found to be sensitive to those drugs so there have been this kind of you know uh, mis not misinterpretation but there has been a certain dichotomy of these results and that is why mouse foot pad still remains the gold standard but there are disadvantages to mouse foot pad method so here what here uh, this has been taken from the il textbook okay uh, il textbook page 577 second edition so here you can see that only the concentration of 0.01% dapson okay is able to inhibit bacilli growth okay everywhere else let uh, if it's lower concentration of dapson or rifampicin or ofloxacin okay in in the presence of these antibiotics the bacilli is able to grow and reach high numbers but dapson 0.01% is able to inhibit bacillary growth and 
you can see that only 0.01% is stopping the growth of bacilli. So it is resistant at the level of 0.01%. That means it is high resistance in case of M. leprid to Dapson. And in similar interpretation, it is resistant to rifampicin. It is resistant to ofloxacin, sparfloxacin. And here we can see that in the presence of clofazamine and clarithromycin, the bacilli count is very low. It is not even detected. For example, it is a minimal detectable bacillary number. That means any bacillary number above this level will be detected and below will not be detected. Okay. So, Dapson 0.01%. Clofazamine and clarithromycin were able to stop bacillar growth and that is why it is sensitive to clofazamine and clarithromycin and dapson 0.01% but lower concentration of dapsons are not able to you know uh, stop the growth of bacillus. Now remember that why are we using the sequential concentration because 0 0.001 okay let me just write it. Yeah, 0.0001% is roughly equal to 1 milligram a day for humans. Okay. So, if a mice is fed on a diet of 0.0001%, it is equivalent to a human feeding on a diet of 1 milligram a day dapson. So, that is how conversion rate and it should be sensitive to that level and that is why when it is not able to stop the growth of bacilli, we call it as resistant to dapson. So, this is the mouth foot pad method. Second method is mutation detection by sequencing. So, what happens is you take a skin biopsy sample, you cut it into very, very, very fine particles and store it in 70% of ethanol. After that, you extract DNA by the procedures. I am not going into details. You extract the DNA and the DRDR region, the region, the drug resistant determining region is amplified using the PCR technology. Again, I am not going into detail, but by using the PCR technology, the DRDR portion is, ampli is amplified. It is increased in, in number and these are analyzed for specific specific mutations so you look for the mutations in that particular region of genetic code okay and it is independent of viability of m leprid so remember in the mouse footpad method when we, in the mouse footpad method when we were discussing the disadvantages of mouse footpad we, we told you that it uh, you require a living viable growing bacilli for it to be effective but here we are just looking at the dna sample so, DNA can come from non-viable, viable, dead bacilli also. So, we just take the DNA, amplify it by using PCR, look at the specific region and test for each and every mutation. Clear? So, this is mutation detection by sequencing. So, this is an uh, image that I took from the internet, but this is the reference for that. Everything must have a reference as far as possible. And here we are checking, about, uh, checking for the RPOB gene. So, RPOB gene is the one which is responsible for resistance to rifampicin and you can see that the, uh, the wild type and the Brazilian strain, these strains have, the, have normal values of RPOB gene here. But the, the, this, let me just mark it, yeah, this graph, this point is very low very low fluorescence that means certain stains sorry certain strains of bacilli hold a mutation and these mutations have been highlighted below so hold the mutation at certain segments and the mutation levels were found and because of that the rpob activity was not that much detected and the strain is resistant to rifampicin you need not go into detail this is just to show you how a mutation detection by dna sequencing actually looks like Third method is mutation detection by DNA microarray, by DNA microarray, okay. Now, it, the thing is that for DNA analysis, uh, the, the second method, the DNA analysis method, you require a proper sequencer, okay. What we do in here is that you take oligonucleotide probes, which correspond to RPOV, FOLP1, gyra gene. Okay, so RPOB is responsible for rifampicin resistance, Paul P1 for Dapson resistance, and Gyre for quinolone resistance. Okay, so these are the coding region of that gene, and you have a probe which is, you know, uh, which is analogous, not analogous, but you could say complementary to that portion of gene 
and that probes are attached to a glass slide. So these are known as capture probes because they are supposed to capture the gene uh, gene segment from the strain that we are testing. Okay. So let me see if I can able to make it uh, a bit more, um, let's say, uh, easier to understand. So let's say you have a bacilli, you have a bacilli, and from the bacilli you take the, the genetic code, you take one strand out of it, and this is the gene segment, the DRDR. So what you have, let me just change the color, yeah. So what you have is a segment which is complementary to your DRDR, okay, clear? And what you do is, you take this segment out and plate it on a glass slide. Okay. So you have a segment of RPOB, you have a segment of FALL-P1, gyre. Okay. So you plate the green part on the glass slide and when you, when you hybridize this glass slide with the genetic material from the strain that you are testing, if the strain has normal gene segments, it will get attached to it. If it is abnormal or mutation specific, it will get attached to the mutation specific probes. Okay. So when this attachment is present, for example, for example, I'm, I'm looking for a certain specific mutation in RPOB gene. Okay. And I have a probe, a oligonucleotide probe complementary to that mutation. So I take that probe, attach it to a glass slide and then course the strain segment DNA on the glass slide. If the strain also has that mutation, it will get attached to the complementary probe and remain there and that attachment can be seen and further diagnosis of resistance can be made. So results are red like, let me change the color again, yeah. So results are red like DNA analysis, okay, and you just see it like in a, in a plotted, in a western plot or a southern, uh, no, in a southern plot, in a southern plot uh, you see like DNA analysis, the same way you see the DNA microarray. There's another thing which is known as reverse hybridiz hybridization. So what happens is that in this scenario, in the first scenario, you are, you are plating the probes on a glass slide and then washing it with the sample. In reverse hybridization, you put the sample on the glass slide and wash it with the oligonucleotide probes. That's why it is the reverse of the first method. So reverse hybridization. And it is available as genotype l dr DNA strip test in Germany. Not in, I don't know if it's available in India or not, but that's what I'll mention. So I thought I'll just mention it here. So here we can see, as I said, that like any DNA analysis, you are able to see mutations. So these are the bands which are get, you know, fluorescence. And it shows that you have this specific mutations of gyrid, RBOB and 119 gene. And this is how you see it on enlargement and pictorial representation. Now, but the fourth method is Bodemeyer method. And what it does is it utilizes 14 CO2 labeled palmitic acid. So 14, CO, 14 carbon or carbon 14 isotope is used to manufacture palmitic acid. And when that palmitic acid is metabolized by M. lepre, it releases as carbon 14 CO2 gas. And the amount of 14 CO2 gas tells you about the viability of the organism. And when the organism grows into a, uh, within an environment which has a drug and it is resistant to that drug, CO2 would be released. And you will see that uh, you, you will say that the strain is resistant to that or drug. So let me see if I can tell you again. So let's say you have a petri dish and you have the bacillary sample here. And after the bacillary sample, let me change the color. Yeah, after the bacillary sample, you cover the petri dish with a solution containing dapson. Okay. Along with 14, sorry, 14 CO2 labeled palmitic acid. Palmitic acid. Okay. So you put palmitic acid here. You put dapson here in whatever concentration you are testing for. And the bacilli is sitting there. If the bacilli is sensitive to dapson, it will die. It will not metabolize palmitic acid and it will not release 
carbon 14 co2 so carbon 14 co2 is not released but if the bacilli is sensitive to dapsone sorry if the bacilli is resistant to dapsone the bacilli will still grow in the presence of dapsone it will still metabolize 14 carbon uh, palmitic acid and will release carbon 14 co2 and that co2 is detected by the analyzers and tells you whether the bacilli is growing or not and if it is growing in the presence of dapsone or any drug that you are testing for it is resistant to that drug the disadvantage is that 10 days to pass 7 10 days to pass 7 bacilli are required for completing one assay that means one drug one concentration is tested in one assay and you require 10 days to pass 7 bacilli for that it is useful for drug screening for new treatments so not particularly much for drug resistances but it is useful to look for uh, newer drugs and find out whether that they are effective against dapsone sorry effective against bacilli the m lepre bacilli or not so now we have read about the uh, methods of looking at the resistances and to find out how do we analyze different strains for different kind of mutations in this segment of presentation we will see the second line drugs that we use okay so this second segment the second segment of this presentation is, uh, is just a discussion of second line drugs like we have done before and uh, subsequently we'll move to the use of those drugs clear let's move forward okay so in the second segment of this presentation we'll be discussing the second line drugs individually so starting from the first drug is clarithromycin it is the most effective sorry most effective macrolide against m lepre so what are the macrolides they have all those you know azithromycin erythromycin it's the most effective macrolide against m lepre dose is 500 milligram a day how it acts it binds to the 50s ribosomal subunit and inhibits rna dependent bacterial protein synthesis now remember that in the process of translation during the DNA multiplication or RNA multiplication, the uh, the mRNA by the use of ribosomes attaches different amino acids together to form longer protein chains. Those ribosomes are a complex of ribosomes, uh, mostly two ribosomes in a pair, and one of those ribosomes, the larger ribosome, is known as 50S or 50 Sidberg ribosomal unit. And that ribosomal unit is blocked by clarithromycin, so the formation of amino acid chain or longer protein chains are not done by using the mRNA as a template. Okay, so that is how clarithromycin acts. So you have an mRNA and ribosomes attach itself to the mRNA, and when they uh, go along, they travel along the mRNA, and subsequently you you have attachment of amino acid and a chain is formed and this chain be will become after modifications the active protein since ribosomes are you know inhibited by clarithromycin this this whole process doesn't happen and the bacteria is not able to form the protein necessary for survival and dies that is how clarithromycin works so uh, although macrolides are mostly bacteriostatic but they clarithromycin is bactericidal for m lepre and it has also been used by uh, used in treatment of other mycobacterium disorders like mycobacterium avium intracellular okay lepre and chelone is already there it is also one of the uh, additional drugs in tuberculosis regimen okay so clarithromycin has no issues with food the food doesn't hamper absorption as such but the dose has to be adjusted in renal disease that's the main mode of uh, you know uh, excretion so that has to be, be adjusted in renal disease it's a pregnancy category c drug okay c for clarithromycin c for category c and we have already discussed it's an older category older way of classifying drugs Clarithromycin is excreted in breast milk and there have been good enough cases to report that hypertrophic pyloric stenosis 
will happen or not will happen there are chances of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis in infants who are born to a mother to mother who have been exposed to clarithromycin okay so a risk of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is always there in the baby if the mother is exposed to clarithromycin so we have to use it when risk outweighs sorry when risk is very very less as compared to the the beneficial effects of clarithromycin clear the adverse effects include metallic or bitter taste fixed drug eruption or leukocytoplastic vasculitis cholestatic jaundice is one serious side effect qtc prolongation now one important side effect of nearly all second line drugs is qt prolongation so qt prolongation leading to arrhythmias should not be used in patients who have other risk factors for arrhythmias uh, not to, it can precipitate torsades de pointis so it's, so these are some of the side effects that you should remember for any of the of these second line drugs okay dizziness irritability hallucinations it can also interact with hiv drugs this becomes important when you are treating mac infections mycobacterium avium intracellular complex uh, infections in retro positive patients then it becomes important this adverse event okay so this was about clarithromycin very very shortly we'll going to discuss second line drugs second drug in the second line regimen is minocycline the dose is 100 mg a month in the rom regimen rom regimen is rifampicin ofloxacin and minocycline i've mentioned it here okay so rom regimen is rifampicin ofloxacin minocycline monthly doses monthly doses okay Addition, one more regimen is PMM regimen. PMM in which rifampicin is replaced by rifapentin, or floxacin is replaced by moxifloxacin, but minocycline remains same. Okay, so this is PMM regimen: rifapentin, moxifloxacin, and minocycline. Okay, now coming back to minocycline. What minocycline does is it binds to 30s ribosomal subunit and inhibits protein synthesis now remember that clarithromycin was binding to 50s minocycline is binding to 30s but the mechanism of action is essentially same it is strongly bactericidal for m lepre but the bactericidal activity is less than rifampicin Okay, remember that rifampicin is the most bactericidal drug. Rifampicin, rifapentin, all this class of drugs are the most bactericidal drugs against M. leprae. So, minocycline also has bactericidal activity, but slightly less than rifampicin. Now, milk and dairy products and fruit juices decrease absorption. So, if you are handling a case with second-line leprosy drugs who is on minocycline, it's a good idea to avoid dosages with milk or near around milk. and fruit juices dose has to be reduced in renal disease because that's the mode of excretion it's a pregnancy category d drug now minocycline is a cousin brother of doxycycline to d for doxycycline and uh, minocycline pregnancy category d this is a stupid way to remember but anything that helps you remember facts data trivia use it So minocycline is excreted in breast milk, but it is inhibited by the presence of calcium in the breast milk. So the effect on the baby is not that much. The adverse events are not that much. But yes, the patient has to be counselled. It's better to have a gap of four to six hours between breastfeeding and minocycline intake. But uh, it can it can seldom be ensured that a gap between breastfeed and uh, drug intake happens. Okay, you don't have a strict schedule of breastfeeding. Now, adverse effects include GI distress, diarrhea, dizziness, nausea, pill esophagitis, that is inflammation of the lower end of esophagus while you are taking minocycline pills. Photosensitivity, yes, photosensitivity is mentioned. These are side effects seen without tetracycline. Even doxycycline is photosensitive. Okay. Mouth sores, hepatotoxicity, impairment of long bone formation in fetus. That can happen if the if the mother is exposed to minocycline. teeth discoloration and even skin pigmentation okay even skin pigmentation remember that minocycline is sometimes used in uh, not sometimes it is used in acne uh, disorders it has also been used in vitiligo thinking that increased skin pigmentation will help in vitiligo pigment uh, repigmentation so these are the side effects of minocycline 
Now degradation products the of minocycline can cause renal damage. Okay. Dress syndrome, which is drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, has also been report, reported with minocycline. So this also includes the adverse events. Now quinolones. So we'll discuss uh, the quinolones are majorly three drugs. You have the most important ofloxacin, followed by uh, moxifloxacin and levofloxacin. Okay, levofloxacin. So we'll be discussing them one by one. Now, ofloxacin is the most active fluoroquinone against fluoroquinolone against M. leprae. The dose is 400 monthly when given in the ROM regimen, otherwise daily. Okay. The mechanism of action is DNA gyrase inhibition. Now, what happens is, if we all know that DNA is a double coiled helical structure. It will be difficult to imagine in a 2D diagram. So, when this DNA is open, it is separated, the two strands are separated. It can form coils, extra coils during separation. Okay. So, those coils have to be removed. There are tension in individual strands and that tension is going to inhibit DNA replication. So those tension, those coils have to be removed. So what happens is that you have DNA strand and then you have a coil and this. So what DNA gyrase does is it cuts DNA into two in this part. It takes, okay, it takes the coil, it let it un uh, unravel and become a straight strand and then reintroduce it inside the DNA segment so that it becomes a new DNA segment without the super coils. And those super coils after removal is uh, then go ahead, then uh, they go ahead with replication and formation of the newer strands. So this DNA gyrase or the type 2 topoisomerase, this is a large class of enzymes known as topoisomerases are inhibited by ofloxacin and since these the gyrase is inhibited the super coils are not removed and because of that the dna replication doesn't uh, happen uh, adequately and you have bacterial uh, death so that is why uh, this is a bactericidal drug where, where am i yeah bactericidal drug and it's an essential part of the rom regimen which is rifampicin ofloxacin minocycline monthly regimen Now quinolones, uh, continuing with ofloxacin, the dose has to be reduced in renal disease because there is 65 to 80 percent excretion by kidneys, 4 percent has, found, has been found in feces. Okay, so major excretion through kidneys, so dose has to be reduced in patients of kidney disorders. You have pregnancy category C, quinolone, cur, C, cur, whatever, whatever makes you remember these, okay. And the newer pregnancy categories that may be acceptable. It is excreted in breast milk, so better to avoid uh, 4 to 6 hours after doses, but it is difficult to maintain. Okay. Now, adverse events include uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, like any other drug, headache, dizziness, agitation, sleep disturbance, seizures, psychosis, hallucination, depression, also uh, acquired pseudotumor cerebri. It can exacerbate muscle weakness, especially in patient of myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis patients, you have to be very, very careful if you want to use ofloxacin. Special side effects of tendinitis and tendon rupture have been reported with ofloxacin. So this becomes important. This is a, a very drug specific side effect. So tendinitis and tendon rupture. Similarly, aortic dissection and rupture has also been reported. QTC prolongation, I have told that nearly all second line drugs have QTC prolongation and uh, and you can also have, you know, arrhythmias because of this. So, arrhythmias are also, arrhythmias are also present. And it is the least of the photosensitive uh, drug of fluoroquinolones. So, we, we told you about ofloxacin, moxifloxacin, levofloxacin, other drugs like prefloxacin or sparfloxacin. So, there, there's a huge list of fluoroquinolones and this is the least uh, photosensitive drug of those fluoroquinolones. <sighs> yeah, the least photosensitive of those fluoroquinolones. Now, uh, coming to moxifloxacin. Moxifloxacin is also an essential part of the ROM regimen, which is the monthly regimen. 
the dose is 400 mg same as ofloxacin and if you are giving it as a part of rifampicin resistant treatment you give it daily otherwise as a part of Rome regimen it is monthly. It is also part of PMM regimen. Remember that when, when we were discussing minocycline, rifapentin, moxifloxacin and minocycline monthly regimen is known as PMM. Excretion. What happened? Yeah. So excretion is by is by kidneys. 25% is excreted by kidneys unchanged. The exact drug gets out of the uh, renal system. 15% is excreted by kidneys in the form of degraded byproducts. So, moxifloxacin as it is 25%, degraded changed products as in 15%, 25% in feces. So, remember that the major excretion is through kidneys. So, in the presence of kidney disorders, we need to decrease the dose. Calcium decreases absorption, so not with milk. It's a pregnancy category C, like all quinolones. quinolones. It is excreted in breast milk, but it is inhibited by the calcium present. The adverse events are adverse effects are same as ofloxacin, but it is more hepatotoxic. Okay, so that is one thing to keep in mind that the adverse events are same as ofloxacin, but uh, it is more hepatotoxic. Another uh, drug specific adverse event is that it increases where it is yeah it increases the effect of coffee and also the effect of theophylline so the intake of coffee should be reduced in patient having daily moxifloxacin and theophylline is also present in in uh, least quantity in tea so maybe stop tea decrease tea the fourth drug is ethionamide. Ethionamide inhibits bacterial cell wall synthesis by interfering with mycolic acid. Now remember that these are all mycobacterium, isn't it? These are mycobacterium. So myco is very essential component of this bacilli. And when that is inhibited, you have uh, cell death. So that is why this eth ethionamide is bacterial cycle. Okay. So the drugs, uh, the dose include 25 to 500 milligram daily uh, daily doses. Let me just change. Yeah, 250 to 500 daily dose of ethionamide. The major action of ethionamide is against M tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Okay, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. That's why it's a part of. Uh, TB regimen, treatment for TB and also used for multidrug TB regimen, it is not recommended for leprosy. It's a pregnancy category C drug, it is excreted in breast milk but not much data is available. Adverse events majorly include vision changes, these are important, okay, vision changes. Blue, yellow, color blindness, blurred vision. Now these are drug specific side effects which are seen with ethionamide. Other side effects include hepatotoxicity, pinprick neuropathy, depression, loss of appetite, metallic taste. Loss of appetite can be severe enough to cause weight loss. Okay, acne, hypersensitivity reaction, disturbed sleep, sorry, disturbed sleep and dreams. So this has been mentioned. If anybody of you have taken ethionomide and suffered from disturbed dreams, do let us know. Bedaquilin, it's one of the newer drugs for tuberculosis management, Bedaquilin. So, Bedaquilin is diral quinolone. It affects the proton pump for ATP synthetase. Remember that in electron transport chain, at the end of that, you have ATP synthase, sorry, synthetase, and it acts as a proton pump. When proton comes from, I don't exactly remember if it comes from upside to down or downside to up, but whenever it crosses that complex, this leads to generation of ATP. Okay, this is generation of ATP and what happens is bedaquilin inhibits it. Bedaquilin inhibits this complex and thus the ATP is not generated, the bacteria is not able to have energy and everything goes for a toss. The dose is 200 mg a day. It is used for TB. It's the first major new drug for tuberculosis and was released in 2004 and the uh, if, uh, first, it came in literature, if I remember correctly, is 2010. Okay. 
and the high cost of beta quinine is prohibitory that's why they use is seldom in tuberculosis and only in experimental setups as of now although the recent guidelines for who for treatment of tuberculosis has mentioned and kept the beta quinine as a part and uh, so its use is mainly for tuberculosis its use in leprosy is where am I? yeah its use in leprosy is experimental and i found this study which has been registered in ctri uh, in phase 2 in which you are, in which it is studying the efficacy of an 8 week beta quinine monotherapy in treatment naive mb leprosy patients so if that study whenever it gets published one might be interested in reading it adverse events again qtc prolongation and arrhythmias okay so beta quinine is done last is newer drugs the, i found one article mentioning the anti leprosy activity of tenofovir emtricitabine and lamivudin which is the tel regimen for hiv okay tel regimen for retroviral infection and it has been shown to be act active against m leprae so there was one article if you want to read just search for tel regimen leprosy and you will get that article lemocycline of the same uh, class as uh, minocycline it's a newer uh, tetracycline so its use in leprosy is being studied other quinolones like sparafloxacin pefloxacin have been mentioned to be used in leprosy the efficacy is not that much as compared to ofloxacin moxifloxacin and levofloxacin and rifapentin we have mentioned that pmm regimen includes rifapentin it's a longer acting uh, substitute for rifampicin so these are some new drugs which you should keep in mind as second line drugs for leprosy now this is the third segment of this presentation we have read about why how do we measure resistance we have read about the different drugs which are used second line in leprosy management now we will learn about how they are used okay it's a this segment will be shorter so in case of dapson resistance okay what you can do in case of dapson resistance is you remove dapson from the triple drug regimen okay so whenever i will say triple drug regimen i mean rifampicin rifampicin yeah rifampicin clofazamine dapson and that is the triple drug regimen in leprosy okay if the if resistance is found to be dap, of through to dapson or the patient cannot you know take dapson you can easily remove dapson from the regimen or you can replace dapson with minocycline 100 mg okay so you replace either you let's say you have a triple drug regimen in hansen's and patient is resistant to dapson or cannot take dapson either you remove dapson or you replace it with minocycline okay so that is how you treat dapson resistance now in the pampasin resistance it has been found it is the, this is the who data and if i remember the correctly it is 2019 gu guidelines or 18 guidelines it says that 1.4% cases of newly diagnosed leprosy patients are resistant to rifampicin while they're in relapsed cases the 8% uh, of the relapsed cases are resistant to rifampicin so uh, the rifampicin resistance is uh, increasing year by year in endemic countries especially like us uh, who have a greater burden of leprosy and tuberculosis for which rifampicin is used so you you may easily find especially in government setups or central institutes uh, patients who have rifampicin resistance okay so what to do when patient is resistant to rifampicin and we'll just have the who guidelines so you have options of three drugs okay yeah you have either you use clarithromycin minocycline and quinolone so you have three options clarithro mino and quinolones okay and in the quinolones majorly you have ofloxacin levofloxacin and moxifloxacin okay so clarithro clarithro mino quinolone in quinolone you have majorly three drugs ofloxacin levofloxacin moxifloxacin okay so what you do is you replace rifampicin with any two of these drugs okay either you use clarithro with mino or you use mino with one quinolone or you use clarithro with one quinolone 
okay so use any two drugs from this group of three combine that with clofazamine okay any two of these three combine that with clofazamine and give it for six months every day and then continue with clofazamine plus one of the second line drugs okay for example in the pampasin resistance, you give clithro plus mino plus clofa for six months and then continue with clofa clithro or clofa minocycline. Okay. Or you give clofazamine with minocycline with, with ofloxacin and for six months and then continue with clofazamine or ofloxacin or clofazamine or minocycline. Okay. So one of those second line drugs will be continued with clofazamine for the next 18 months. Clear? In case of rifampicin resistance, choose any two, <coughs> any two among clarithromycin, minocycline, quinolone, add clofazamine, give for six months and then maintain on clofazamine and one of those second line drugs for the next 18 months. Okay, so that is the regimen for rifampicin resistance. So this is uh, the same thing, but this I have taken from WHO guidelines of leprosy uh, in 2018. So, in case of rifampicin resistance, you give ofloxacin 400 mg, minocycline 100 mg, and clofazamine 50 mg daily for 6 months. Daily for 6 months. And then maintain for the next 18 months. You, you continue clofazamine, but choose one drug from your initial second line drugs. Either it is ofloxacin or minocycline. The dose remains same. And you continue for the next 18 months. Similarly, it's the same regimen. But you can say that ofloxacin is preferred as a maintenance agent also. Now, remember in the first slide of this presentation, we discussed that the resistances are there in rifampicin, dapsone and quinolone. And if quinolone resistance is there, you cannot use ofloxacin. Okay. So, if quinolone resistance is there, you cannot use ofloxacin. So what you do is, in case of rifampicin and ofloxacin combined resistance, let me just clear everything. Yeah, in rifampicin and ofloxacin combined resistance, you use clarithromycin with minocycline and clofazamine for 6 months daily. Then you continue clofazamine for the next 18 months. But choose one drug, either clarithromycin or minocycline. Clear? Same concept is being followed, but you are just not using quinolone. Plus, quinolones are very good drugs. So, it is always advisable that if you are using second line drugs, you should include one quinolone. Clear? You should avoid quinolone only when the person is resistant to quinolones or there are severe side effects which we are not able to control. Let's move forward. So we have discussed dapsone resistant, rifampicin resistance, now clofazamine resistance. Now the data is epivocal. We don't have good data regarding resistance of clofazamine. I think there's only one case report reported in literature, and the dose of clofazamine resistance was very low when they were testing for resistance. So uh, it's not entirely sure whether clofazamine is resistant or not. And if you remember our, our presentation on clofazamine. You will remember that I said there are multiple mechanism of action for clofazamine. Okay. And because of that, the resistance is very low as virtually unheard of. So clofazamine becomes a very important drug as a part of your multi-drug regimen for leprosy. Number one. The major indication in which you would not like to use clofazamine is due to pigmentation. We all know that uh, clofazamine intake uh, leads to a brick red pigmentation for the patient and, and if the patient is not desiring of that pigmentation no matter what or if, the, if you have enteric uh, issues with clofazamine you don't want to use it or if it is not available in the market this happens quite frequently with clofazamine and you want to replace clofazamine with other drugs then you can think about using second line drugs but the, remember that the data is not so robust okay so you may want to replace clofazamine with second line drugs, but remember the data is not that adequate. So you may do it at your own uh, discretion. 
now this slide summarizes what to do uh, when you want to replace a drug in the parent triple drug regimen the parent triple drug regimen is dapson rifampi uh, sorry clofazamine and second line drug quinolone okay so these are the major drugs so if you have dapson resistance you may either remove dapson from the regimen or you can replace with minocycline 100 mg daily if you have rifampicin resistance, use the second line drugs, which we have discussed just one slide before, uh, two slides before. And if you, if, uh, you have clofazamine, if the patient doesn't want to use clofazamine, you may replace it with clarithromycin or you can go with the ROM regimen. Okay, ofloxacin, minocycline, okay, ROM regimen can be used. And if you are uh, re suspecting resistance or if you have a documented case of resistant to quinolones you use any of the second line drug except quinolones so you if you have ofloxacin resistance you cannot replace it with moxifloxacin or you cannot replace with levofloxacin you can you have to replace it with either minocycline or clarithromycin we are clear on that i will remove every marking uh, on this slide so that if anybody wants to take a screenshot, they can take a screenshot. It will help you to remember. Let me just remove all the markings. So, and I will pause for like two seconds, three seconds, so that you may take a screenshot. Okay, so you can take a screenshot now. Good, let's go forward. Now these are just some strategies. The main, the main uh, chunk, the main bulk of the lecture of the video is over. We'll just have few extra points so that if and if a question comes in your exam to write on, uh, you could say drug resistances in leprosy, you may be able to write something about uh, resistance in leprosy and the alternative drug regimen, alternative therapies, you know, and just one some of the few points to uh, conclude your answer. Okay, so these are the strategies which have been mentioned to, uh, to be adopted immediately so as to check the transmission of strains. Essentially, these are the steps that one should take so that the resistance don't develop in patients okay, or don't spread in patients. So first point is robust setup for early diagnosis of relapse and reaction. You diagnose the case early, shift to other drugs so that the uh, resistance is not developed. Okay, you should have molecular screening method for mutations for drug resistance. It goes without saying. Screening of all new MB cases. Screening of all new MB cases for presence of molecular mutations. And then you can, you know, shift around. See, resistances should also always be documented. Okay, so it has to be documented. And you should have proper robust mechanisms, robust molecular mutations analysis so that you'll be able to find those particular mutations okay once an index case is identified the close contact should be screened for signs of leprosy so that you can detect early uh, and give treatment and if you find resistances early you can give second line treatment and after identification of either primary or secondary drug resistance the patient should be treated adequately so that if you start the second line or alternate forms of, of treatment of leprosy you should keep giving it for the adequate amount so that you don't allow resistances to develop clear this slide is just so that you have few pointers on, to answer in your viva or maybe write a short note on treatment uh, second line treatment for leprosy or resistances in leprosy now this is just one slide on how to remember the doses that's how uh, how i used to remember so we can just go very quickly on how to remember doses now this is clarithromycin okay clarithromycin and if you write it as a mirror image a c and extend it like this you have five so clarithromycin is 500 milligram that's how you remember doses now, minocycline, as I've said before, minocycline is cousin brother of doxycycline and doxycycline capsule, the most commonly that we use in acne or to battle staph infections, comes in a dose of 100 mg. So, it is same as doxycycline, 100 mg. Ofloxacin. So, ofloxacin, when you say 4, okay, so when you say 4, your mouth turns into an O. So, this is ofloxacin. 
since ofloxacin and moxifloxacin belong to the same uh, group the dosages are same 400 mg in case of levofloxacin if you write 5 uh, let me write it again yeah if you write 5 we have used the bottom half for clarithromycin this time we will look at the top half so this looks like an l okay a sleeping l if you rotate it left 90 degrees it becomes a n okay so you can write 5 as l c l for levofloxacin and c for clarithromycin so both of these have 500 milligram as doses and ethionomide is the fifth letter of the alphabet so the dose is 500 milligram that's how i used to remember this clear let's move forward now just one slide on uniform MDT or UMDT. I thought uh, this this is a good uh, area to discuss, not discuss, just mention about UMDT. Now what UMDT says is to give in all patients, all patients of uh, leprosy irrespective of PV or MD, you give the triple drug regimen for this much amount of time. okay so essentially the duration of treatment is shortened when compared with the mb leprosy treatment we all remember that before the change uh, of by of who uh, roughly around five five years back the treatment for pb leprosy treatment for pb leprosy was dapson with rifampicin for six months For MB leprosy, MB leprosy, it was Dapson plus rifam plus rifampicin plus clofazamine. Twelve months. This was initial treatment regimen. Now it is everything is same, but they have added clofazamine for PB leprosy. So all drugs have to be given six months for PB, twelve months for MB. The difference in uniform MDT is that all three drugs will be given for six months, irrespective of PB or MB. Okay. The issue with that is the treatment which was initially for 12 months in MB leprosy is now being shortened to six months. And a shorter treatment will lead to relapses, it will lead to resistances in PB. So the criticism of uniform MDT is that it might be treat under treating the MB cases. So initially if the treatment was for 12 months, now it is for 6 months and the treatment might not be adequate. So it is under treating MB cases. Also a shorter duration of treatment will lead to rifampicin resistance. In cases of our country in which you have rampant tuberculosis, we need to we need to save ourselves from rifampicin resistance. So if you give it for a shorter duration, you are always having a risk of developing resistance to rifampicin and by UMDT you are having a resistance to rifampicin. A good point, a good point about uniform MDT is that in a study conducted in India, and if you want to read that study, I'll be I'll be attaching this uh, citation in the in the description. Just copy paste it and go to the individual article. The relapse rate was found to be a less than 0.37% over 5 years. And the target for a new drug regimen should be less than, if I remember correctly, it should be less than 5. So it shows that the rate of relapses was not that much. However, there was some criticism of the paper that the sample size was not enough, the uh, follow-up period was very short and uh, not, not properly documented MB cases were not included. Uh, it could not reach the threshold of saying that it is educate or not. Those criticism aside, but if you want to read a bit about uh, use of UMDT, you can just read this article once and you'll be able to easily answer, at least write something while discussing uniform MDT. Now some extra points and I think this is the last slide of the lecture. So I'll just read through it. There's nothing much to remember. A good points which, which can be very good viva questions. Okay. This can be very good viva questions. So SDG or Sustainable Developmental Goals which is set by WHO regarding leprosy is zero leprosy by 2030. So WHO says that by the, by the year 2030 there should be zero leprosy cases. Clear? But as per the National Leprosy Eradication Program, 
NLEP gave road map for leprosy and this road map the document was titled as road map for leprosy this road map was released on 30th january 2023 which is in national leprosy day and it said that forget about 2030 we will reach zero leprosy by 2027 3 years before the who mandate okay so india says no problem we know that we have 53.6% of global leprosy cases this year don't worry by 2027 this will be zero Okay, so the roadmap says 2027 zero leprosy. WHO says you can have zero leprosy till 2030, not more than that. Okay, the last point is prevalence. Prevalence per 10,000 patients, uh, sorry, 10,000 people, and this is the 2023 latest data, and this I've got from NLP website. Okay, so for India, the data is available only of 21-22. The, it says 0.45 is the prevalence of leprosy. The highest prevalence, prevalence was found to be in Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Maharashtra. While for Delhi, where I live, it's 0.8. And the northeastern states like uh, Andhra Pradesh, Haryana, JNK, they have as low as 0.1 or 0 0.0. Okay, Tripura and Meghalaya have 0 0.0. That means too small to measure when the denominator is per 10,000 population. Of course, when the denominator becomes per lakh or per 10 lakh, you might show some readings on this scale, but that is just a rough enumeration of prevalences. Okay, with that, uh, I finished this lecture. It has been very long uh, lecture for me, especially uh, in one go, it becomes very tough and a bit tiring. And speaking for uh, more than an hour requires some effort. So uh, I would like you to go and see other videos also. We are not covering just leprosy. We have already covered immunosuppressive reagents. Uh, we have covered uh, systemic steroids. So go and see the uh, these individual videos. Other drugs for leprosy like Dapson, Rifampicin, Clofazamin, Teledomide have been covered and we'll be continuing this series uh, every week on Saturdays. We'll meet and discuss uh, dermatology, drugs in dermatology, regimens in dermatology and the hope is to learn a bit about drugs so that we can use it and uh, the hope is to uh, make sure that these kind of resources are available so that we can come back and revise share it among each other so that they can also learn about not learn particularly of course you will learn while using those drugs but you should have uh, you should have some amount of knowledge beforehand so i hope i know this is a very long lecture and i won't be speaking more but it's a good idea to go through these videos go it go it uh, go through it once and go through it uh, at 1.5 x the speed the second time you see it and uh, I have different timestamps in the description. Go to individual segment and look at it. It's a good idea to watch at 1.5x. And uh, I've met some of my viewers who have said that they listen to this video uh, while traveling or while walking or while driving to work. And that actually makes this a good effort uh, while I'm still recording this at around uh, 2 a.m. at night. So it becomes, the effort becomes worth it. So thank you all for uh, personally telling me that you have been watching my videos. Trust me, every person who watches this video and if, if there's a, even a single person uh, who, who benefits from these videos, the job is done. Okay. So if you have any clarifications, if, you, if something that I have said might not be correct, tell me. We'll rectify it. Comment or any doubts, any other questions that you have been asked and we, we have not answered. We can search about it. Any suggestions on how to make these videos better? Any queries? You can email me directly at my email ID or you can just mention them in the comments, uh, comments below and we can move forward. Okay. So with that again, adios and ciao. I hope... I hope I've made the second line treatment regimen for leprosy a bit easier. Bye-bye.